Welcome to Nervous Rex. I have Eric Nice in the studio. My man, we actually have a similar story in mm -hmm. that we both came from MTV back in the day. Yep. And now we're out here in California getting our shit together. Yes, sir. Right? Is that fair to say? <laughs> yeah, I would say so. That's pretty accurate. Let's uh, give the people watching or listening, what do you think you're most well known for? Would it be MTV, Real World, Grind? Yeah, the okay. Grind was probably... The one, well, I mean, real world and grind because real world's still going. Right. The grind um, ain't. And right. So, um, but at the time, the grind had a, a, a lot more viewers than, um, than the real world because we were broadcasting all over the world at that time. Right. So we had like 90 million viewers. And the show was for people that might be too young to remember. I remember it. It mm -hmm. was you with beautiful girls and beautiful people dancing to the latest hot music. Yeah, we were in a club. We were yeah. dancing. We were playing videos and there would be live performances. So whoever was, you know, hot at that time in the 90s. Uh, would come on on the show and perform, and then celebrities would come and co-host. Yeah, it's like one of those typical MTV shows. Right, and I'm remembering, did you get to meet Biggie Smalls? Yes. Tell me about that. I've actually hung out with Biggie a couple times. Tell me. Um, well, he, he launched his television career, basically, on the grind in Lake Havasu, Arizona. That was his like, first television appearance, and that was pretty awesome. Um, and then I had a really good friend of mine, uh, my good friend Beckham, it's an Albanian kid from uh, up in the Bronx. And uh, one time we were in Miami and a friend of mine's uh, were throwing a party at the Tudor. And one of my friends was promoting, all my friends were the bartenders, the bar backs, like everybody was, it was like my whole crew. And so Beckham just happened to be there and Biggie comes walking down the street and so we ran outside and we brought him in and, you know, we spent like six hours that night wow. drinking Hennessy, yeah. smoking blunts, like the whole thing, yeah, you know yeah, what yeah, I mean? Yeah, and it was cool, you know, like when you, you know, when you're in an environment like that and you get to connect with somebody like that, um, it's really awesome to see them for who they really are yeah. and not that whole, you know, television persona. Yeah. So I had sort of the antithesis of that. I got to hang with Tupac. So we, we kind of had the same yet opposite. Same here. Yeah. I did a movie okay. with Tupac. Oh, which one? Yeah, um, Above the Rim. Okay. And tell me about... Tupac to me was someone that walked in a room and lit up a room like almost nobody I've ever seen. And I've been mm -hmm. around a lot of famous people. And a lot of times I'm quite underwhelmed when I meet a celebrity. Like, oh, that's it? Yeah. Tupac, on the other hand, blew me away with his charisma. Yep. Was he like that when you hung out with them? Or yeah, did we I just spent get... like a week together. So wow. um, I spent a lot of time. I think the one thing that really got me is, you know, like when you're in the entertainment business and you get to, you know, be on both sides, uh, you really, you see somebody for mm -hmm. who they really are. Right. Um, and there's a lot of truth to, okay, well, I'm going to be this person, you know, I'm going to create this character mm -hmm. that I'm going to be. And that's what I saw in a lot of cases, um, especially in the hip hop world, because, you know, back in the day, it was like, you know, how many times you got shot, you know, yeah. what, you'd sell more records. Yep. So if I was this hardcore gangster, um, like in the time when NWA and all that stuff came out, you, you know, it would propel your, your career. Yeah, absolutely. And you're from New Jersey, yeah. so you probably connected more with Biggie's music than Tupac. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think so. Yep. I, you know, I'm from California, but I actually connected with Biggie's too. I wasn't a huge Tupac fan musically. I just loved what he was about. Yeah. And then... It's hard not to connect with yeah. Biggie. Yeah, <laughs> right? I mean, are The you production really... was incredible, you know? There was some, dude, they just did something so special with that production yeah. that just got everybody moving. It was crazy. That, and that was an era, too. I remember I moved to New York, 93 to 98, and I got to that little window of time where I worked at MTV for a couple years in that window. But also, really, what was special was that that's the golden era of hip-hop was, you know, yeah. that window of time was so magical. And to be in the streets in New York when a record would break it's and amazing. Stretch Armstrong would be playing mm -hmm. some new record and you're like, what is that? You know, there's no internet or nothing yet. So he, a DJ would break a cool new record and it would spread. And yeah. to be a part of that was really special. 
And we both, so what years did you work at MTV? What were the years that you were there? Uh, 90, I think real world was 92. Yeah. And then 93, 94, 95, 96. Oh, was you had a good grind. run. Okay. You had a good run. So how did you get the real world? Was it an audition? And did yeah. you do the first season? Was that right? Very first season in New York. And I got, I was modeling and doing commercials at right. work at the time. Right. And it was just another casting that came through my uh-huh. agency. And you were in New York. Yep. And you got the real world. And please, we were talking about this yesterday at our friend Lisa Cooper's place. If you wouldn't mind sharing the same story about how, you know, let's talk about how you got the show, your experience on the show. And three-part question, and how you saw yourself on the show and what yeah. that did for you. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we're obviously we'll bring everything full circle, and uh, like we were talking about before the interview started, like, or in the beginning, like, we're here just healing and, and um, you know, making sense of all this. But, yeah, the, the real world for me, it was an incredible experience, and uh, it's still unfolding for me you know, even many, many years later. But the the real world was like a mirror for me because, you know, here we were doing this reality show that had never been done before. And so they just, they didn't really have a reference um, of how to produce it. And so it was really raw and authentic. And so the first month and a half, they were just following us around, filming us, doing whatever it is that we were doing. And then there was this lull because nobody wanted to hang out with each other. So everybody would go home and we had we were able to do that because we all were from the area. So I'd go to Jersey, Kevin would go to New York, you know, go upstate. Mm-hmm. Everybody would break off. And so then they they pulled us back in. And then they started trying to create drama and planting different things here and there Mm -hmm. and we just sniffed it out immediately and we said listen if you're going to play the hand of god here like we're going to leave so just let us be ourselves and let this roll out the way that it should and then there won't be any resistance because you know you're, you're you're playing you know it's like when you manipulate a situation it's like you have somebody else that's coming in and and kind of like turn turn turning the wheel and changing an event yeah. Right. And Which if you don't know do. what they're yeah. doing. Yeah. Right. And it happens all the time in reality TV. But like I guess you were the beginning of that because it hadn't right. been done before. Exactly. So, you know, when the first, when the shows came out, I'm sitting there with my family and my friends and I'm watching myself on TV and I didn't, I didn't particularly like what I saw within myself. Right. I saw the way that I was behaving and how I was reacting to certain things and, um yeah it was uncomfortable for me but at that time my career was about to explode because right after the real world is when i got the grind and the next thing you know you know it's 100 miles an hour right you have all these people all these vultures around you trying to get a piece of what you got you don't know who to trust there's a ton of manipulation and control that's going on and it's really confusing if you don't have any guidance and you're 21 yep ish so you're just a baby like that's yeah, that's a lot to take on at that age mm-hmm. uh, to handle fame alone, much mm-hmm. less you know, even just if it wasn't even fame, just that much success. And I know MTV wasn't really good with paying a ton of money, but it was probably more money than you uh, or I were. Twenty-one year old, you know, we're supposed to be in college. Yeah. And instead, we're just living the life of Riley, partying, traveling. I was, thought I was a millionaire. Yeah, we yeah. were. Well, it's all relative, I guess. At the time, I remember MTV didn't pay much, but it was enough for me to. You know, party and hang out. Do whatever in New you York want. City, yeah. And everywhere you went, it was free. So yeah, not true. only were you making money, but I never paid for anything. Right. I didn't pay to get to a club or to dinner or, you know, sometimes I fly for free. Most mm-hmm. of the time you're flying someplace, somebody else is paying for it. Right. Your hotels, everything are covered. You're getting free clothes. You know, it's pretty incredible. So when you said that you're still, I don't know what the word you used, I forget, processing, seeing yourself back then and still dealing, working with it. What, yeah. what do you mean exactly? Is it that you uh, are still reeling or is it that you are still tripping out on just the fact that, you, like you said, you held up a mirror to yourself and really that's the most amazing self and out. It's like, not, that's a cool, in a weird way, that's actually a blessing because that's right. you get to see yourself in a way that most people never would. Yeah. Like, That's it. Pretty cool. It took a long time for me to realize this, but the worst things that I thought had ever happened to me in my life were actually the biggest blessings. Right. Um, And that's just a a ton of um, internal 
you know, standing in front of the mirror. Yeah. You know, who are you? Why are you here? Right. What are you doing? Why do you behave the way you behave? Yeah. Why, why do you operate the way that you operate? And so that's the journey that I've been on ever since I saw myself for the first time like that on TV. And so it's this unfolding. And I call it this the deprogramming of my ancestral lineage because I've been for years I've been working with medicine, been down to the jungle a ton. Um, I mean, if there's a fast or a cleanse, that is on the market i've done it probably a number of times and so i've been on a really intense spiritual journey to to purify and cleanse my soul to open my heart uh purify my mind understand you know the programs in my family my ancestral lineage and you know really taking that on you use the word healing uh, and I'm curious what that process is for you. You just said plant medicine as well. Maybe some of our listeners want to get a little more information on that. Cause I know I do. There's so many medicines out there. Mm -hmm. Do you mind sharing which ones you've worked with and, and you, yeah. the experience you had? Sure. Um, I, I, about, uh, 10 years ago I met, um, I was introduced to a grandmother named Mona Palaka, who's one of the 13, uh, grandmothers. She's a uh, Havasupai uh, Hopi uh, grandmother. And um, through, through my work with fasting and doing fasts in the desert, long fast, water fast, juice fast, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I was introduced to the Native American medicine wheel. And so, you know, went through like the rite of passage, you know, working with Native American Indians and things oh, that, like that. That's amazing. And so I was getting a lot of people in this in the LA area were inviting me to go to ayahuasca ceremonies. Uh -huh. And uh, I always felt that if I was gonna do it, I wanted to go down to the jungle. Mm -hmm. So about four years after people were inviting me to do that, I got the strong calling, it was time to go. So I called Mona and Mona set me up and I went down to the jungle for the first time. Where Peru, where'd you go? I went to Brazil okay. actually to a, um, it's called the Santo Daime community in Mapia. And um, it's like a Christian, Christian-based uh, ayahuasca uh, community. Never knew that was a thing. Yeah, it's beautiful, man. There's just the first ceremony I was in was for. It's crazy. It took two days to get down there. The person who I was supposed to go to, their visa, what didn't work, so I had to go by myself. I was on like an eight-hour canoe ride up yes, the river. Love it. Um, you know, I got there, and then the following day, I was in a, like a a twelve-hour ceremony, and drank like 18 cups of ayahuasca and nothing happened. And That's I thought, interesting. this is crazy. I came all the way here to drink this sacred juice and nothing happened. But I was there for a few months uh -huh. and uh, then the experiences were profound. Okay, so I've never done ayahuasca. Really? It hasn't happened yet, but like you said, it's gonna be one of those things where it's time it's gonna happen. I've been offered it a couple of times, but it didn't feel right and I didn't wasn't comfortable with the people or the situation so i didn't do it uh -huh. um i like you want to go do it in at, at the source uh but i just watched this movie called the last shaman i don't know if you've seen it, yeah, I've and, seen it. and the native uh the i guess he was a not he's an indian from brazil or peru it was in peru yep and he said they actually asked him at the end of the movie it's one of the things that stood out in the movie they're like how do you feel about people serving the medicine in north america because the movie is about a north american kid who goes down mm -hmm. there and he's like, that's fine. You can serve it up there too. You don't have to be down here to do it. So that kind of shifted my, because if this guy's saying it, who's was the real deal, yep. I'm like maybe I don't need to go all the way down there to do it, but I want to. Our friend, certified health nut Troy Casey has shared mm -hmm. his journey with the you know natives playing the flute music and the trees. It, that seems like to me how I want to do it. Yeah, the, 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 the tribe that I work with now is called the Shipibo. Yeah, that's and, who he did it with too. And the Shipibo yeah. are considered the masters of ayahuasca. Okay. If you ask any indigenous you know, tribe, they'll right. all look to the, the Shipibo as the masters. They're, the lineage of ayahuasca was passed down from the Inca to the Shipibo. Okay. Um, so if you are going to sit, and I invite you to sit whenever you're ready, mm -hmm. you can sit with me. Um, Thank you. So, you know, the people that I work with, the lineage that I work with are in the highest of integrity. Yeah, I've heard good things. And 
I'm sure some people are listening to this, like these two MTV guys on this path of enlightenment. And you know what? I get it. Uh -huh. But also what I get is that I would rather be this cliche <laughs> yeah. than the cliche who's still chasing the party, chasing, a, you know, uh, this empty, never ending quest to yeah. get laid and party and like. I don't know about you, but I fulfilled all the external mm -hmm. shit I could possibly fulfill and then some. Yeah. You know what I mean? The status, the things, the chicks, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. And I just want something else. Right. Well, you know, the reality of this brother is that everybody's suffering. Yeah. You know, like how many awakened, enlightened, you know, beings are on this planet? You know, there's a history of them. You know, there's some yoga teachers in the far east like yogananda but you know the stories of buddha and jesus liberating themselves from suffering you know so for me like i don't want to suffer i don't want to live in pain i don't want to live with anxiety or depression or or judgment i don't ever want to judge myself or yeah. judge anybody else because that causes suffering yeah and so that's what my that's what my journey's about. It's first and foremost, it's about liberating myself from my own suffering. And that's why I, I chose this path because my childhood was traumatic, mm. big time. Um, and I was suppressing a ton of emotion and rage and anger. And when I was on MTV, I was a narcissistic, selfish, arrogant, egotistical jerk off. And I was a womanizer. So, you know, that's that's the reality of it. Yeah. And so, you know, yeah, I could have chose to be that for the rest of my life. Yeah. I could have continued to entertain the entertainment industry mm -hmm. and what it brings, the money, the fame, the girls, and all that stuff. But it was empty. Yeah. It's fleeting. And it doesn't bring you happiness at the end of the day. I don't care how famous you are or how much money you have. If it, it, Unless you're doing deep spiritual work on yourself you're lost i agree and i think i'm a little late to that party so to speak you've been on this path for a while and i've recently i'd say the last four years i was living right up the street here in hollywood and mm -hmm. i sold my house in laurel canyon because i was still in the matrix of the hollywood world and no matter you know, it's a beautiful little tree house it was amazing but when you go down the hill you're in hollywood around all the tmz trucks and the just the, the craze it's madness yeah. so i moved out to the beach four years ago and it as crazy as it sounds because i'm still in la but it changed my whole environment which helped me a lot because uh, I have the ocean. I got mm -hmm. Lisa Cooper's house, our yeah. friend who <laughs> serves and is a healer. And the mayor. Just surrounded, yeah, exactly. She's the, <laughs> she's the mayor of Venice. Uh, the queen bee. She is. And <laughs> I've uh, been opening my mind to other experiences and things that have been way more fulfilling. I just had this guy, Wes Watson, on the pod who I showed you. Mm -hmm. And he said a couple great quotes. One of them is, perpetual pleasure chasing always ends in regret. Yeah. And I couldn't relate to that one more. You know, at the time you're doing these things to fulfill your ego and, oh, I could get the pretty girl to do all these things. I mean, it, where does it end? What's the end game? Yeah. So for me, I ran it pretty good for a while, you know, and no regrets. I'm here. You know, I definitely hurt some people along the way and got hurt and mm -hmm. just was living a very selfish life. So I totally get you probably more than most people. I mean, we have a very similar story. I yeah. did the modeling. I did the MTV. I had the overnight success. I had all the attention and... It just, uh, I don't know, man. I got a view from the top and it wasn't as good as I thought. Yeah. You know? I agree. Yeah. So now, okay, so now here you are. 10 years you said you've been doing the medicine and mm -hmm. on this path of getting yourself right and helping others, I imagine, is part of your journey. Yeah, yeah. For the last 13 years, I, I created a program. It's called The Beauty Way. And uh, it's a 30-day uh, program to rehabilitate drug addicts. And I bring them into the high desert and I guide them through a transfer, transformational experience. Uh, I detox their bodies with superfoods and nutrition. Man, this is they, great. They do saunas, they do mineral baths, they do grounding, we do qigong, we do breath work. Um, and then they're facilitated through the Native American medicine wheel to reconnect with the source within and source without. 
Great. And do people ever say, hey, wait a minute, you're the guy I grew up on. And is there that moment ever happened maybe during medicine or a yeah. psychedelic experience? Because for me, that's another weird thing for me. And this is just my ego, obviously. And I'm aware of that. But sometimes it's hard to be in certain environments when you get recognized because it takes away from what it should be about. Because no matter what, at the end of the day, people get weird around, even if it's a very small level of fame, it shifts the energy to a place where it maybe isn't as what it's about have you had that experience i'm so happy you just asked that so this is what happened um i'm walking down the street one day with my buddies my best friends i grew up with and we're having an awesome time so we're laughing we're telling jokes we're just in the moment it's a beautiful new york city day like on the what weekend year is this? roughly i want to say i don't know in the late 90s okay. at some point and you know so we're having this this great time and then all of a sudden these three people they come over and they they recognize me and they got a whole bunch of questions and they're super excited and that's all fine and great but i had this this epiphany in that moment that they 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 took me out of that very mm -hmm. special moment with my friends mm -hmm. um and i actually thought about that for a long time what does it mean to be in the moment? What does it mean to be present? You know, to receive the gift of being present in the moment with yourself and your surroundings and wherever you are, like not in your head, you're not thinking about other things, you're just present, right? And uh, I wanted that. And I realized in that moment that I didn't have that and that any, at any given time, it could be taken away. And so I started to pray for that to be taken away from me. I'm sorry, for what to be taken away from? Fame. Okay, wow. And being yeah. recognized on yeah, the street. I get it. Um, and then, that, then I went deeper into my own healing and separating from society and going into nature, spending a lot of time in nature yeah. by myself. And, Good for you, um, And so, you know, now I walk, I walk around and nobody recognizes me yeah it's you've very taken, uh, very yeah. rare that somebody recognizes me and but what i love is the other day i was walking in runyon canyon i was walking my sister's dogs and i was coming down the path and i see this woman she's like looking at me from a distance and i was like because you're always wondering you know like why people are looking at you right especially you're if, conditioned if, that way yeah, yeah exactly and she said to me she goes hey you're eric niece aren't you and i was like yeah yeah that's me she's like how you doing I'm like, I'm doing really good. How are you? And she goes, oh, that's great. I'm so happy to see that you're doing so well. That's beautiful. And I said, thank you very much, sister. I hope you have a wonderful and blessed day. And she walked away. And I was like, yeah. yeah. That's what it's all about. That's great, man. Those interactions yeah. is what I love. Because right. you know, bro, it's, you know, it's like when you put yourself out there, you put yourself out there for criticism. You put mm -hmm. yourself out there for judgment. So I've been in this place for the last like five years because I went through this thing called the dark night of the soul where all of your suppressed childhood emotions, they come to the surface at the same time. And it's taken me years to get through it and a lot of medicine, a lot of spiritual work. Um, and I didn't know that I was carrying that around. And so I get asked, people get, you know, they ask me to do things. They ask me to do podcasts. They, you know, I get offers to do things. I'm, and I was at this place in my life where I couldn't even walk out the door. I couldn't even be in public. I was so uncomfortable yeah. because I was processing all of these suppressed emotions from my childhood. The dark night of the soul. Yeah. N-I-G-H-T or K-N-I, what does this mean? N-I-G-H-T. Okay, dark night of the soul. Yeah, it's, I mean, you've heard, you know, embrace your shadow yeah, and course. all that kind of shadow work. Well, yeah. this is like, you know, the darkest of the shadow wow. where... Um, I mean, it's it, it's a lot to get into, but yeah. it's spiritual and it has to do with the spirit world and like entities and things attaching to you and creating these aspects within yourself, mm. like the protector and the controller that get put in place to protect the inner child because the inner child doesn't want to experience the pain um, and those things from the childhood. So it'll put all these aspects in place. So you have to go, you have to play this game, this, you have to navigate, you know, through these aspects and these spirits to get to the inner child. So the inner child f is trusts and feels safe to express itself authentically. 
Um, and that's where the real true healing takes place. Wow. And that's the work that I do now with people because I went through it myself. Mm -hmm. So I understand it. So I can sit in front of somebody. They just tell me their story and I go, oh, well, that's because this happened with your mom and this happened with your dad. And they imprinted this ancestral lineage program onto you. The program is running and you just got to go in and deprogram it. And then your life will completely transform and change. Yeah, it's amazing. You're doing that work, man. You know, it's, uh, it's, I think this is beautiful to hear because for me, I couldn't relate more. And I don't know if everybody could understand what you and I have been through. Again, not mm -hmm. a, we're not saying we're Tom Cruise here or anything, but there was a <laughs> level to where it was disrupting your vibe and, and you hang out with your friends or, it, you know, for me, like I want to go do psychedelics once in a while. And I, you better believe that if I do mushrooms or something with my friends, I can't go out to an environment where someone's going to be like, hey, are you the guy? And they bust out their phone. That's going to yeah. change the whole thing. So I totally understand you pulling away from that because it yeah. could fuck your head up. I mean, well, those sp those spaces that you're talking about where, you know, where you're choosing to go connect with some type of plant medicine. Mm -hmm. That's very sacred. Oh, yeah. You know, this is sacred to the yeah. soul. It's sacred to your inner child. Yeah. And you really want to honor your inner child because yeah. if you take your inner child into an environment like that you're betraying your inner child because now you're taking the inner child into an environment that's not safe for them right so that's why i'm very very serious when i speak to people about them choosing who facilitates them yeah through these types of experiences absolutely someone to hold space and where you are i mean obviously set and setting we all know that term and and being in nature, you talked about earlier, for me, I get that so much because I grew up my whole life in San Francisco, New York, Los Angeles, that I have been in nature enough to where I appreciate it. And I think I'm what's called like a hypersensitive, like my, my mom said when I was born that I was, the doctor said I'm one of like 4% of the population, which is hypersensitive to sound and light and people's energy. So mm -hmm. when I'm in nature, it relaxes me and heals me as much as being in the city, like, like rattles me. You yeah. know, and just people rattle me. And so when I go into nature, it's so good for mm. me. So that's why I got my RV so I could unplug and just go into nature by myself. Like you just said, I go alone and I'll just drive up the coast and have no idea where I'm going and just go for two weeks. Yeah. I did my maiden voyage by myself, I've gone a few times alone and I'll just drive up to Big Sur or wherever and go into nature alone and just, dude, it's, it's so healing and yeah. I don't even need any. I mean, sometimes I have, but I don't even need any drugs or anything to, to just nature is so yeah. natural. <laughs> right. Yeah, we, we, we talk about that we go alone, yeah. but when you do it enough, you realize you're not, you're not alone, alone yeah. at all. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you have, you have the spirit of the water, yeah. you know, because that's what we are. You have the spirit of the wind because that's mm -hmm. what we are. Mm -hmm. You have the spirit of the earth and the minerals and the rocks because that's what we right. are right. and the fire. Yeah, you know. So when you're out there and you're you're sitting by that fire and next to a stream and it's just quiet and peaceful, and your mind is empty, you realize how connected you are to everything. Yeah, you know that's important. It's for me. I'm. I couldn't understand that more. For me, that's so important, and I suggest to anybody listening just one of the best things you could do if you're feeling depressed or you're feeling down is to go out and one of them is my friend chris ryan is i always talk about him on this podcast he's just a mentor of mine and he's always when i get bummed out about something he'll be like dude go help others and see mm -hmm. how you feel or go into nature yeah and those are the two things that i've found for me if i'm ever feeling like you know sorry for myself or down and out or you let the shit get to you like those are two good tools that mm -hmm. are pretty immediate for feeling better and putting shit in perspective yeah you know he wrote a new book called the uh, civilized to death which is about how we got it wrong and we're living in this human zoo if you look around we're not meant to we're not designed to be living in boxes on top of each other and not introducing mm -hmm. yourself to your neighbor for four years who you never even said hello to like shit's fucking we got it wrong yeah. we're supposed to be tribal we're supposed to be communal on some sebastian younger tribe shit you know and tribal was that his book sebastian younger's book did you read that one me I and haven't. lisa were talking about yesterday but yeah anyway uh you know we're designed to be in these hunter gatherer groups like sharing food and, mm -hmm. and being a com in a community and i could speak for myself here too well, i spend so much time alone that it, I, that's not healthy and i mm -hmm. think i read that you know, in, in the 50s, 5% of the U.S. population lived alone. Now it's like 40% or something alarming. Yeah. It's a lot of people living in solitude, and 
that's not healthy. Yeah. yeah. Would you agree? Yeah, definitely. Community? But I think it's coming back. I yeah. think the tribes, man tribe? the tribes are coming back. Exactly. Great segue into man tribe. Let's because talk about it. Right in the middle of Venice on any given Friday night, there's 30 to 60 guys that get together that are there to, you know, put their hearts on, you know, on the table and, you know, find that vulnerable place within and that safe place within to share their story yeah. with other brothers. They're, they're sitting together doing breath work. They're doing uh, cold plunges, sitting around a fire, uh, praying, uh, you know, talking about the traumas from their past. I was at one last night and this brother had an incredible release and a healing um, because there was 40 guys sitting around him and, you know, we let him know that he's safe, he's loved, he's protected here. You know, it's okay for his inner child to express himself here. Nobody's here to hurt you. No one's judging you. Right. You're safe. You yeah. know, so if you want to feel it right now, let's do it. And sure enough, he went in there, bro, and he's had this, you know, his body starts shaking and he's crying and, you know, he's releasing all that energy. And this is what it's all about. Like, that's what this time for me right. personally, because of my personal experience, like this is what it's all about. It's about the community and the tribe and all of us coming back together, sharing our experiences with each other to assist each other on this healing journey. To me, there's the, the most important thing that anybody can do right now is focus all your energy and your intention on healing your heart. Yeah. Healing your, your family because that's where your power is. Your power and your strength is in the suppressed emotions. It's in the judgment of the things that happen to you in your life. So if you can walk through this life with no judgment of yourself and no judgment of others, you f you're freeing yourself from suffering. And you're inspiring others as you walk through life and you share in places like the man tribe. Right. Uh, would you say that I've... I hate to always make it about me, but that's the only perspective I know. But <laughs> I've had the same thing where I've had the, uh, like I felt like I had a paperweight on my chest. Yeah. Like I couldn't, like open, I couldn't breathe. And it was obviously just some blah, you know. And look, again, some people may not believe in, first of all, to me, everything's energy and vibrations, right? Let's yeah. just start there. That's mm -hmm. just, first of all, that's like a scientific fact. I think right? everybody knows that now. Uh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> but anyway, let's just say some people don't for the sake of argument. And everything's energy and vibration. And we do have this stored energy in our body that doesn't come out. It's why like moving and shaking the shit out. Like you see your dog shaking out there, get yeah. rid of that shit. Yeah. And, and we don't do it enough. We sit around all day. Most people aren't moving and just getting that shit out is very helpful. But I had this one for years, man, like this block on my chest that I felt like, like fuck, it felt like a, 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 a dumbbell on my chest. So my ex-girlfriend, she lived in London and I was visiting her and she's like, I have this Reiki healer who I want to send you to who's supposed to, so, you know, supposed to be amazing. So I go to this Reiki healer. I've never done Reiki before. And you know, it's just energy movement. It's like, mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be more of a massage. I didn't know. I was pretty naive to it, the work. And this, you know, older Japanese man, simply would put his hand on these meridians on my body and sort of just move. And I was like, come on, man, just rub my shoulders or something. Get in there. Didn't, it was very simple. And I walked out of there for the first time in years. Mm. I was like, dude, I went in there so pessimistic and I walked out a believer. And I love when that happens. I love yeah. being wrong. You know, I'm, I'm always wrong. And I love being wrong because that's when you learn the right answer. <laughs> yeah. So I went in there just sort of in my head and not in my body and not believing because I don't know. I grew up, my dad's a breathwork coach. I grew up in that scene so much that to me, I sort of have my half in the door, half out the door about what's real and what's not. I've seen the good, the bad, everything in between. And for whatever reason, I was just not believing. So I went in there and came out a believer and it was pretty awesome. So how do you feel about Reiki work? Oh, I mean, yeah, any, there's all kinds of different energy work and they're, yeah. they're, they're all beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love them. Yeah. Uh, what would you tell somebody listening or watching this right now, something that they could maybe st a starting point for something that may be a good first thing to do for uh, maybe the ice bath, the breath work, yeah. I think. I, I mean, think, that's the easiest. That I think so too. It doesn't cost anything. Yeah. 
You know, you don't you don't need to be with anybody to do it. You right. can do it by yourself. So there's really no excuses. Yeah. Um, and you know, on Wim Hof's website, he has instructions. It's three days. You get a 10 minute video one day, then a 10 the next and a 10. So you learn the breathing, you learn the ice and then the meditation, mm -hmm. and then you can do it on your own. And yeah. the, and the, and the, the, as you know, the benefits, the results are phenomenal. I yeah. committed to that for four months. I did it every single day, did not miss a day. I was jumping in a freezing cold river in the winter. That was probably, you know, 38, 40 degrees. And I've made a, I've made a promise to myself because I, I tried it back at, um, a, a year earlier, but you know, I was doing like cold showers mm -hmm. and I really wasn't committed to it. And so I felt it was time and I, and I went for it and bro, the things that I experienced in those breathing sessions with myself mm -hmm. and being in the water, dude, I had no idea that I could be sitting in the water and then all of a sudden releasing stored emotion. Mm -hmm. I was having, I was having visuals, um, remembering things uh, from my past. Sometimes I would be crying next. Sometimes I was coughing and, you know, spitting up things. And if you've worked with ayahuasca, you know, there's all these different ways to purge, you know, like that dog, when the dog is shaking, mm -hmm. you know, that happens a lot in, in medicine because the vibration, it's like, it's shaking the energies that are not serving you out of your yeah. body. Uh, I, yeah, I uh, can vouch firsthand that the breath work and the ice baths are very a good shortcut to getting there and getting out of your prefrontal cortex monkey brain and into the reptilian yeah. brain, which is just getting out of your fucking head. Yep. Let's start there. Yeah. Right? We're all just yeah, overthinking everything. It strengthens your immune system. Oh, yeah. It strengthens every, every system in your body. And it feels... and. Besides all that, if you just want to feel good, like forget right. all the other shit, like you could, you could just, you want to feel good, try that. I am a big supporter of the Wim Hof breath work. His, his method's amazing. And, but you could find your own, like, you know, just try a cold shower and breathe into it and just see what happens. And you'll be surprised how good you feel. And you'll just be vibrating all day. I'll give you yeah. an example. There was a, uh, someone I was working with, 19 year old girl who was dealing with terrible anxiety and depression. Um, there was a lot of trauma, trauma from her childhood. And so I'm introducing to her all these different modalities that she can use to help herself. Um, so I introduced to her the breathing and, and the Wim Hof. And so we did it one day, you know, and it was, you know, it was challenging for her, super cold, like everybody. Um, and so as we were working together, like a day or two later, she's like, yeah, I feel really anxious and really depressed today. And I said, did you do your breathing and your cold plunge? And she's like, no, I didn't do it. I said, why not? And she says, you really think that works? And I said, well, it worked for me. And I, the only way that you're gonna find out is if you do it and see if it works for you. And she was super depressed, really anxious. And she did five rounds of the breathing she sat in that cold water as long as she could because what I advise people to go in until they start shaking and mm -hmm. then get out. Mm -hmm. And uh, 15 minutes after she got out of the water, I said, how do you feel? She goes, anxiety and depression, gone. Yeah, I believe gone it. Gone for the day. I believe it. And I was and like, that's enough. Because the brain, the mind is causing the anxiety and the right. depression. Whatever right. it is that you're thinking about right. or you're stressed about or yeah. you're obsessing about or you feel guilty or shameful about, that's what's causing your your you know anxiety and depression yeah a thousand percent uh okay so we agree on that anyone listening if you want to start there i think uh the cold yeah cold therapy and i i prefer the ice bath to the shower but if you only have the shower go for it you know mm -hmm. for some reason submerging to me is way better way uh, better way better even the cold shower is even harder because you have parts of your body that aren't exposed. It's almost yeah. more uncomfortable I'd getting rather, in. Yeah, Me I'd rather too. do the tub. Crazy. <laughs> and there's you could just go online and look up different breath. You could look up Wim Hof. There's so many types of holotropic breath, right? yoga nidra. What are some other ones maybe that are some standard ones to just, you know, it's really the power. We did this yesterday. So you and I, we did a breath work class with yeah. our friend yesterday. It was about a, what, 45 minutes, hour of just right. breathe, one breathing pattern. <sighs> That's yeah. it. It's that simple. So <laughs> inhale through the mouth, open your stomach, heart, exhale. And you just yeah. do that for long enough. And my hands were cramping up. I was, dude, I was high as fuck. I was seeing shit. I mean, <laughs> dude, it's fucking rad. Yeah. Like, That's what Wim says, right? Get high off your own supply. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
yeah, so it's out there and it's those tools are and, there. And it's need. growing, brother. Oh, I mean, yeah. Like absolutely. I said, you know, the man tribe is a beautiful, beautiful thing. There's brothers that are tuning in from all across the country. There's tribes that are in San Diego. There's tribes that are in New York and Chicago. There's like the men are coming together. And what I love about this, based off of my personal experience, is that, you know, we're, there's a big, big challenge out there, you know, as far as like men really, truly understanding what it means to honor a woman and like show up yeah. in your family in, with your, right. your children and your wife. And like, what does that even mean? Yeah, to, yeah. Like if there's any men that are listening, have you ever even thought, do you even know, have you ever asked a woman, what does it mean to you for a man to honor you? Right. You know? Yeah. And I think what's happening, what I'm observing is that with these men's groups is that when the men find the strength and the courage to get vulnerable and expose their secrets, expose the basement and the attic and the closet and the bedroom and the kitchen and all those different, you know, Before conversations yeah. and, and experiences that mm-hmm. happen in all those different places in the house. Right. You know, where, like, where do you store, right. you know, you know, old pictures right, and right. all the experience, uh-huh. you put them in the basement or you put them in right. the attic. Right? right. So when you go up and you explore all of those places and when you can, when you can share yourself with no fear, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, no matter how terrifying it is, as soon as you do that, now what? If, 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 if I had a, if I had a TV screen over the top of my head right now and it said, you know, Eric Nice, May 23rd, 1971, you know, uh, uh, a bullied and abused and tortured by his brother, you know, uh, lost his virginity uh, to a woman. He was raped, you know, raped later on by a man, uh, you know forcefully you know put himself on on a woman when he was a teenager you know like all these things that i've done that i've felt ashamed for and that i've been scared and terrified to talk about right bro as soon as i started talking about it as soon as i started shining light on it and exposing myself in total transparency to my friends to my family to the world everything is gone there wow. is no more stress. Right. Right. Why would I be stressed? Yeah. Why would I be depressed? Right. Why would I have any anxiety? If, if I'm an open book right. and everybody knows everything yeah. there is about yeah. me, dude, this is why I believe that I did the real world. Yeah, I was going to ask, do you think that was uh, you know, 100%. a blessing that it all happened? One of the greatest yeah. blessings in my life. Great. Yep. Yeah, it's a good way to look at it. Yeah, because, you know, but now when I watch reality, t- it's difficult for me to watch reality TV yeah. shows now because I see all of these people yeah. exposing themselves totally. for really what it is. Right. You know, like, and I don't even have a TV, but when I go work with somebody, like, I'll tune in. You know, I was watching this client that I was with. They like The Bachelor, you know, and all that. And I'm like watching The Bachelor and I'm going, so this guy and this girl are choosing for this amount of time to hang out with 30 different men and women, kiss all of them. They're getting paid to do that. Isn't that like a, you know, and then they have these private rooms that they go into. Isn't that kind kind of like a form of prostitution? I mean, pretty much. And the whole thing is so crazy to me (laughs) that that it's just okay and normal. Like, I'm like, what's wrong? I feel like... But but that's the thing, right? So, and that's, the you know, when you're in television... I don't know about you, but I went down the rabbit hole. Like I wanted to understand why television and entertainment and these movies really existed. What's their purpose? Yeah. What's the message that they're putting out? Because when I see what's going on in the world, all I see is a bunch of programming going Mm -hmm, on, mm -hmm. programming us to think a certain way, walk a certain way, dress a certain way, eat a certain way, behave a certain way. And if you're not doing all that, yeah, the people that I see not doing that are the ones that I see that are empowered. Yeah. It's like, we're talking about the homeless thing. You're like, I get it. Yes. You know, you're like, I get not wanting to be a part of the structure of society and be a sheep with right. the herd. I, I understand that. Yeah. To a that certain freedom. Degree. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because these chains of society, yeah. they're, they're, 
it's dangerous. It is, and dangerous. it's killing people. It's yeah. killing people left and right. Yeah. Well, good. All right. First of all, thank you for sharing all that with us, and uh, I, I really love your story and everything you're doing. And thanks, brother. If, if you want anybody to. Uh, find out more about what you're doing is there any website or anything to bring some yeah attention? but I've, yeah. my website it's ericneese.com great e-r-i-c-n-i-e-s.com okay so that's where people could go check out and maybe hit you up for some of your work or whatever yeah you can great. connect me you know, great. on email dude thanks for your time thank you uh, continued uh, uh journey on your path is amazing and uh, i can't wait to see what happens with you and i look forward to yeah. sitting with you and yeah, yeah let's money. do it <laughs> that's gonna come all full circle dude it's maybe awesome. you're the guy to take me who let's knows let's go brother thank you bro appreciate <laughs> you yeah, I love you.